Well, uh, thank you, Sophia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, uh, thank you to, to Plugs for inviting me, especially Sophia again, who, who I had the, the pleasure of teaching while I was at Porto. Uh, uh, feel free to interrupt. Uh, just remember that I cannot see you, so don't raise your hand. I wouldn't, uh, I'm not able to see it. Just wait for me to finish a sentence or something like that and, and speak at will. Uh, I've done, a, I think it's not a, a long presentation, but I can speak about it as long as I want. So feel free to interrupt and I'll try to measure the time and, and, and act accordingly. Uh, so basically the, the topic of my talk is as you might have guessed, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but punctuated with natural stupidity, not only my own, probably, you can always assume that whenever you don't agree or you think I'm stupid saying something, that's meeting the objective of the, of the talk. So let's push forward. I only have 15 slides, so don't worry, it's not too much. It's more a question of what I do with them. So everybody can see the, the first slide. So everybody has correct sharing or whatever. Well, I, I'll assume yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So this is just a, a brief review of my, my bio. So I, uh, I went from physics or I started in physics. I started in physics as many of you, I guess. I'm always assuming sort of a undergrad slash master or PhD level audience. Uh, 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 with a few, with a few ex colleagues in this case, uh, to which I, uh, I thank you your your presence also. Uh, but anytime you 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 think that I'm going to junior or to senior, if you have some questions, you can always ask me. So I started in physics. I started in a, a course, of course, uh, a degree with a funny name. Uh, it's physics engineering. So physics engineering has the problem of not being physics and not being engineering. So uh, I was at Technico, who is the, I would say, leading school in engineering in, in Portugal. And they wanted to have physics, uh, and, but they couldn't call it just physics because that's an attribute of a uh, science faculty. So instead they went for physical engineering. So in Technic, everybody's an engineer except us, sort of. They look at us sideways. But if you cross the street and you go to somebody who is taking proper physics, they look at us as if we are, basically guys with hammers and nails and trying to pronounce Einstein or something like that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the degree I took was mostly theoretical. I, I, we had a, a wide array of choice of uh, courses that you can take. Uh, and I, I took all of the theoretical ones. So I would say I'm a physicist, not an engineer to begin with. Although I know how to weld. I know how to use a welding machine. I know how to use AutoCAD and a lot of, uh, uh, of, of technological stuff from the engineering side. Uh, then I did my PhD just in physics, uh, in Technico with uh, Professor Orfeo Bertolami, who is a professor there at Porto. And uh, I think many of you have, know him. Uh, I finished in 2006, so I was born in 78, which, uh, which is depressing. It's starting to be depressing to say. So uh, uh, I finished in 2006. Uh, then I went for a postdoc also at Technic at the physics department that got bumped to, uh, uh, I just put researcher, but there were these special grants by the, the, the state uh, that were awarded to various uh, research institutes. And I was uh, awarded one at the Plasma and Nuclear Fusion Institute, which is a funny one to be in because I did cosmology. Uh, but I, I think it, that's because our team was productive. So the, that center decided to, to capture us, although we weren't exactly in, the, in their core business. So until 2013, I, I remained there. This is basically also a technique, although legally they had independent existence. Uh, and then in 2013, I decided to uh, move partially to Porto. So I went there for the, the weekdays and I came back for the weekend to Lisbon. Uh, where I was an invited lecturer uh, and that uh, uh, I, I stayed there for four and a half years uh, until the end until the end of the, the second semester of 2018 uh, when I returned to Lisbon permanently. So this is just a short bio or maybe not so short uh, here on the can you see the mouse pointer I guess so. 
Yes. So here, yeah, thank you. Here on the right hand side, I'm trying to convince you that I am a proper physicist. And notice I use the verb am or the, the present tense because that, that, that doesn't change. I might not be a professional physicist, but I am a physicist nonetheless. So this is my attempt to convince you that I, I, I am a proper one. So I have uh, 44 peer reviewed papers with a Hirsch number of 22. Uh, plenty of talks and uh, refereeing, uh, advisor to students, etc. I'm not trying to say I'm an excellent physicist. I, I, I like to think I, I, I am, but of course, plenty of other colleagues also uh, deserve that, that moniker. Uh, but at least I'm trying to convince you that I didn't go from physics to whatever because I couldn't pull it through in physics. I, I, I think, I believe that I would be able to keep doing what I was doing productively uh, and competently. Uh, and what I was doing was mostly, if I had to sum it up to one word or two, uh, general relativity. So I won't go into general relativity. That's not the title of the talk. Uh, I guess plenty of you have, have met it uh, academically, maybe professionally in PhDs or, or, or above. Uh, and even the undergrads, I, I guess everybody wants to, to know about general relativity. So to sum it up uh, in, a, in basically one equation, these are the Einstein field equations or just the Einstein equations. They are equations, plural, because they are uh, tensor equations, which is sort of a matrix. So you can imagine here you have a four by four matrix. So you would get 16 equations, but then you have some symmetries uh, that reduce the number of equations, but there are more than one. Uh, they are, of course, as everything else in physics, mostly differential equations. And what they do is that they relate uh, the structure of space-time given by this G mu nu, the Einstein tensor, with the content, the energy and matter content of space-time. And uh, one way of talking about it, and this is just a personal uh, choice I did, is to consider that the space-time uh, structure gives you the context. So it could be cosmological context, context. You're looking at the expansion of the universe as a whole. You consider the universe to be to have several characteristics, such as being homogeneous, being isotropic, etc. Or it could be local. You could have a, a particular point in the middle, let's call it the sun, and you're uh, looking at how planets revolve around it and looking at corrections to, to Newtonian motion or it could be whatever you want. So the, the, the space-time gives you the context. The, what you do with it is you, you stick into that context, a particular energy momentum tensor. So you impose a model, uh, which again is very abstract. It's just a way of saying that here on the uh, right-hand side, this energy momentum tensor could come from a scalar field. And it's, uh, a scalar field is basically a, a function you could think about it as a complex function uh, with given transformation properties, basically that it doesn't transform to anything. Uh, and you, you can think about it, for example, in a cosmological context that can give rise to inflation, which is the early uh, epoch of accelerated expansion of the universe, or in late times uh, to quintessence. Quintessence started uh, at the end of the 90s when it was discovered. Actually, it started many, uh, many million years ago, but up until the 90s, uh, when I was a kid, uh, people discussed if the universe was going to expand forever, but ever, ever slower, or if it, it, it was going to collapse into, into itself. Then, and this was, uh, this was the reason behind the Nobel Prize in physics, of course, people found that there is due to, for example, looking at supernovas, uh, there is a sort of, um, uh, well, what Einstein called his big, biggest mistake, but in a uh, different context, a cosmological constant, for example, or a scalar field or a vector field or any given uh, number of models that make the universe expand at an ever growing rate. So it's expanding and it's accelerating. And this requires some sort of repulsive uh, uh, force or pressure uh, to account for that. So you could see that just by looking at this equation, I could go on for a long time. I, I won't do that. Uh, although it's a fascinating topic and it was a topic that basically dominated my, my I would say, wouldn't say my life because you always have uh, something else, personally and other interests and et cetera, but my professional, 
and 20% of my non-professional life for um, almost 20 years. So this is the end of me talking about myself uh, as a physicist. But after I, I was a physicist, a physicist, I went to consultancy. And the reason I did that was it, it, I would say it's the natural choice for any physicist is to go to either consultancy or data science or something tech related. Uh, and I went to consultancy because basically I didn't want to <clears throat> migrate to a, a, a job as a code monkey. So if you, you can always just reinvent yourself and study a lot and become a web developer or whatever you want to do. But, uh, but I didn't want to do that. So I basically advertised myself by answering uh, a lot of uh, ads and talking to people as a physicist, somebody who actually doesn't know how to do much in consultancy or tech, but can learn quickly. So these two slides, and I promise I won't take too long with them, are the way of uh, uh, letting you all know, especially the younger, uh, the younger students, that you can pr pursue physics, you can uh, go to physics, have a future in it, have a career in it, and then stop having it. Uh, and if you did the, the, the math, this is 2018, so I was almost 40. So it's midterm uh, in, in, with respect to the, the usual lifespan. And you can stop having a career in physics and nevertheless get a job that pays about the same, uh, also because I'm not looking for a lot of money. Uh, and, and have a productive work life using your skills in physics. So what are those skills and how do I use them? Well, in consultancy, I would say it's mostly related to project management. When I say project management, it includes talking to teams, keeping tabs on who whoever is doing what, uh, making sure that deliverables are met. So you have to produce this report by this date and then somebody has to review it. Uh, this is an area where physicists are, are very good because we are very used to doing project proposals and also getting them refused, but that's another, another, another matter. Uh, and you know that uh, basically it's the same. Most companies in Portugal at one time or another uh, apply for projects uh, with, the, with the, the state, the state agency. Uh, you have plenty of them. You have European Union programs. A lot of money is going around a lot more than in physics, trust me. Uh, or in science in general. And somebody has to write the proposals and somebody has to convince the jury that we are answering societal challenges, which is a, a buzzword also used in, in science proposals. Uh, and that somebody in the case of LCG is me because I have the, also the English. Sometimes you don't think about it. And this is much of my message regarding this personal bit is stuff you take for granted and you even feel I'm not that good. Uh, my English is not that good, or I'm not that smart, or uh, I'm, I'm a little bit shy, or whatever. You step out of science, and everybody is, is, has more difficulty speaking in English, or just speaking, period, or doing whatever. So we're all geniuses. Just by being here, I, 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 I I can tell, I can assure you that if you step to the outside world, you're a bona fide genius, uh, even if you come just straight out of physics, uh, of the physics degree. So uh, something else that I do as a consultant is uh, what I call a brain trust. So it's not an actual function. Uh, and you notice this is not Einstein. This is just a mask of Einstein, but it's good enough for most uh, purposes in people. So people need some internal research they ask me and they ask me because they know I was, I was a researcher. They trust that I'll probably do it better, better than they do. And usually they're right. Uh, so they just ask me, can you look it up? So for example, uh, two months ago, I did a benchmarking on current, uh, current practices on quantum computing. Uh, and I did it with the power of Google. Of course, then I read some white papers. Then I, 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 I read a lot of uh, uh, semi-technical blog posts, etc. But it wasn't something that nobody, that I had privileged access to. Just a way of physicists interpret information and the fact that we are very used to going through a huge list of papers to come up with who, whoever was the bastard that came that found out the formula we were looking for before we did. So all those skills that you use every day, don't even think about them. 
suddenly become valuable in the in the outside world. Uh, documentation, that's a given. So the fact that physicists write so much, uh, particularly in English, uh, is a is a plus. And also what I like to call a commercial stand-in. So there are commercial meetings. You have plenty of consultants with a, a, a necktie and a blazer. And they look, the, the typical consultant you see in commercials for Mercedes, perhaps. And then you have me sometimes. I go in the typical uh, uh, college professor uniform. So uh, plaid trousers, uh, a shirt, but not uh, a very a very good shirt or very professional shirt, like a shirt with uh, squares or something like that. Uh, and uh, never take a, a necktie uh, unless it's really important. And also a blazer, but not a blazer that matches the trousers like a suit. And the purpose is to act sli slightly funny and talk about tech stuff and mathematics. It gives credibility to whatever the commercial guys are pushing. If you have a, a scientist standing in to deliver like five minutes of mathematical mumbo jumbo for the, the, the clients, the clients won't understand it. And that's what makes it credible. This is a, a, not a good thing, a thing to say, but it's, it's, it's sociological. So I do that a lot. Uh, and I, I think I'm good at it. Uh, and then you have to modulate the way you see your audience if they look like people who like jokes, you go for the jokes because you're the, the wacko scientist. So you can say whatever you want. If they look like they look, uh, they, they know about engineering, you start talking about rockets and uh, SpaceX. So you have to have a, a good array of stuff to say. So after I went to consultancy, and this is the, the, the part where I finished talking about myself. So thank you for listening. Uh, uh, I went to data science. And data science, uh, uh, it wasn't after, it's parallel. I, I would say I do 20% consultancy, the rest is data science. You have a huge amount of tasks you can perform uh, all in, in the company. Uh, when I say in a company, it could be either a company that does only one thing. So you, some of you might know Gilbert Loreiro. He was a student at Scoop. He's a colleague, he was a colleague of many of you. And he has a startup, for example, uh, that is looking to detect patterns in, uh, in, in textiles and defects in those patterns. So that would make, make it fall in the computer vision uh, uh, topic. And so he does it for a living. Or you can work at a company such as myself works at the LCG. And we, we basically sell our services to companies that need an expert or a work done in that area. So uh, we do all of these these are, I would say, the tools that I use. Time series analysis, looking at how phenomena changes over time. Forecasting, trying to come up with what happens next. Computer vision, plugging a, a camera into a program and finding out how many boxes of cereal are on a shelf. Uh, churn and retention, these are commercial terms. It's You don't want to lose clients, you want to retain them. Uh, you don't want them to go away. Lead generation. You want new clients, you need leads, you need clues as to how you get the best clients. Uh, recommendation engines, those you know, just what movie do I want to see today? Or if I bought this, what should I buy uh, next? Uh, sequence mining, uh, if I go to, uh, if I buy flour, milk and eggs, a lot of times, maybe I'm trying to bake a cake. There is a sequence here. Uh, sentiment analysis, so who likes my blog post or my Facebook post or whatever. And uh, entity matching, I put them sort of in order of interest to me. Entity matching is just trying to come up with duplicate records in a database that refer to the same entity. You have plenty of, uh, well, you have two main types of learning, the supervised and unsupervised. Uh, supervised. I say learning as in machine learning, you, you put a computer looking at the data and learning some pattern, some model from it. If, if you have labeled data, so for example, this is good, that is bad, this is a label, good slash bad, then you have a supervised problem. But you could have an unsupervised problem. You could just have men and women, short and tall, and you just want to cluster them into groups, but they don't have a, a, a t-shirt saying, I am a man and I'm tall. 
So you have to learn from the actual characteristics and come up with a classification. Uh, and also problem fixer. This is everything you can imagine. Check the code of, of other people, help them find better algorithms because the ones they use has been deprecated since the, the, the 18th century. Uh, help tweak parameters, make an algorithm faster or maybe slower, but better. Uh, communication scientifier is taking an email from somebody and making it look like it was written by a college professor. Uh, uh, tech nanny is sort of the same. It's taking uh, some kid who came out from the third year from a, uh, uh, he's not even a master's student yet, but he has, suddenly has a job and he has to learn some new technology. There are plenty of, uh, of opportunities for physicists. And given this, there are plenty of tools. So this is just to convince you that you know some of these, which will be helpful if you migrate, uh, and that you don't know many of the others, but you can learn them quickly. I'm saying this because, well, I've used these three cloud services once, never heard, well, heard of it, never touched it uh, before three years ago. It's easy to learn. Uh, parallel programming and uh, or uh, if you want to use uh, graphic cards you can also program in those nowadays it's more it's more tenable for young people to do this but n nobody thought about it when when basically when I, when when i learned programming but it's easy to learn to learn python that's what everybody knows nowadays all the young kids i had never touched it until two years ago but now i do when it's it's actually very nice uh databases those are ugly and slow, but they're also easy to use. Uh, and the, the point is that whatever technology is thrown at you, because you need to use it, uh, you can adapt. And as a physicist, you can learn to use it in, a, well, at least three years time, two years time. So you use plenty of technological setups. And now for the actual main part of what I think people- Sorry, want George, yes? can I interrupt? Why, why you put Photoshop there? Is there any? Oh, because you have to do presentations and sometimes you want to uh, do a collage of plots that came out of R and they look uh, ugly and the, the labels are in a ugly font that was selected by R and you want to put a single label or just stack one plot on top of the other. That's, that's, a, that's something I actually already use it in physics. Sometimes I wanted to just cut the, the, the fat from a, a, a plot produced with, a, in my case, Mathematica mostly, uh, and superimpose it into another. So that sort of stuff. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, of course, you don't need to know Photoshop to become a data scientist, but it helps. Uh, everything helps. And that's uh, one of the, the, the things I want to transmit is that we as physicists have a, the ability to use a huge amount of tools that you don't even notice while most people specialize in one or two tools and they use it exquisitely they're, they're experts probably but then they need something else and they ask you and that's your 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 added value it's not being an expert in all of them it's being the guy who can do well you you won't if you're a company you want to hire one expert in each so it's better to just hire a physicist so now for the, the more technological part of the talk, I selected a few of the, basically it's the, the topics I like the most. Uh, all of these I've, I've, I've touched in my, in my professional activity as a data scientist uh, for client, for this, for, for, for example, clustering, we used this uh, some months ago for, uh, and when I say we is me plus two other colleagues. Uh, for segmenting the cl the clients of a major uh, uh, medical uh, medical what, what do you call institution yeah I would say in Portugal uh, when I say clients I mean 1.5 million so that's a, a huge number uh, and uh, and you have a huge amount of data so I think I think most people are sort of familiar with the terms at least I won't go too much into the description clustering for example is taking uh, data and uh, coming up with some segmentation, some way to group the data when you don't have a label for it beforehand. So you just, instead of having people who are from Lisbon or Porto, you just have people who are from, who have several characteristics and I want to 
say these are uh, uh, urban uh, dwellers, uh, mid age, these are more rural people uh, and old age. So I would have to come up with an algorithm that classifies people into th these two groups. So regarding clustering, uh, you have plenty of, of challenges. The first one I would say is to select the type of clustering. And I, I don't even mean the algorithm, I mean the actual type. So you can go hierarchical or, or non-hierarchical. If you do, uh, uh, if you take the hierarchical approach, which is basically depicted here, this is the so-called dendrogram, also very used in biology and evolution uh, of species and etc. Uh, basically, you say that you can go top down or 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 bottom up. So imagine each person or each species is a single cluster of itself. So you have as many clusters as you have individuals. Then you group them into clusters of two, or it could be clusters of 10, but you group them into clusters of a given number. So you fuse them, basically. You have to have a way of choosing which groups you create. And then once you've met that criteria and you have those groups, you fuse them again. So you go to the next level and you go to the next level and et cetera, until eventually you come up with a single cluster, which is just the whole universe of data you have. Or you can do it the, 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 the inverse way, which is quicker because you can stop at any given time. Just take everybody and first you just partition them into two groups. Then you look at each group and you partition them into two other groups. So you have powers of two and then you slash your, your algorithm whenever you feel comfortable or whenever business like dictates. So for example, you wouldn't have 512 different segments of clients that wouldn't be very good for the marketing department. Uh, even though in mathematical terms, what you do when you want to decide the number of clusters is you look at when your algorithm is, is not giving relevant information anymore. So imagine that I'm looking at the, the average distance between points of the same cluster. So I've, I've said that some of us are urban dwellers and other of us other, some other of us live in caves and are, are not so, so, so urban. I can separate the cave dwellers into cave dwellers and mud dwellers, but do I gain a lot of information if I do that? Maybe not. So then I won't do that, that other segmentation. So this tells me like when I can stop my algorithm and I particularly like uh, hierarchical uh, algorithms because they, they give you a sense of order. You always know that this segment belongs to the segment above, the father segment, if you want to call it that, and then to the segment above. And that can help discussion and that can help a business understand how they're going to send emails asking for your private data to, to, to use. Of course, always remember this is all for corporate purposes and profit and etc. So I won't go into the morals of it if you have any qualms about it. I also have some. Uh, uh, I've been lucky not to be involved in anything I wouldn't agree with. Uh, aside from the part of people having more money than me, I don't agree with that, but that's life. So you have another thing, which are non-hierarchical algorithms where you don't specify this sort of um, iterated approach. Instead, you just say, I want 10 clusters for some reason, maybe a business reason. They want to send uh, emails to 10 different segments of clients. Uh, and you have several algorithms. The most well-known is k-means. And k-means, I won't go into it that much, but you can see it here. Usually people show you uh, like two or three clouds of points with different colors. And it, well, you have one cloud here, another here, another here. But actually what k-means does is partition space into the so-called uh, Voronoi cells. So you can see you have the centroids that are painted in black. And a Voronoi cell is the set of points that is closer to that to this given point than to any of the other black points. So K means basically in a, a patterns space. Uh, and then you have an assignment. This data point belongs to the cluster that is closer to a given uh, centroid. Now, you might notice this is self-referential. Uh, uh, 
a data point belongs to a cluster because the data point is closer to the, to the centroid of the cl cluster to which the data point belongs. If the data point didn't be belong to that cluster, the centroid, the center of mass, if you want to think about it that way, or, would change. So k-means is a, an iterative uh, procedure. You start with a given distribution of imagine 10 centroids. So you start with 10 clusters and then you see if there are some data points that want to go from one cluster to a better one, to one that is closer and you update the procedure. And you do that several times until you're satisfied according to some stopping criteria and you have your, your model. So of course you can always in the end ask me details. Uh, notice I am not an expert in the academic sense of, on any of this. Uh, but uh, I know in, uh, I'm a physicist looking at this and using this, which is, uh, believe me, much better than being a non-physicist to begin with or uh, many other, other professions trying to do the same. So ask me whatever you want at the end regarding, or now, if you want, you can always interrupt me. Uh, now we go for forecasting, for example. So you have plenty of techniques. I've just brought the probably two most well-known, at least in terms of introduction to the subject. You have uh, exponential smoothing. And the way to read this is, imagine you have a given quantity. It could be cash flow of your company, or you could be uh, uh, consumption of uh, utility, electricity, for example. So that's X. Uh, it's a sequence, so you have x at a given time and you have x at the next day. This, of course, is already simplification because it's a continuous function, but let's ignore that. And you want to smooth the way that you look at your consumption of, of electricity. So, you know, to, even if you think that you're a very regular person, today you use a given amount of, or this minute you use a given amount of uh, electricity, the next minute you think you didn't do anything, but it's going to change. So an exponential smoothing, what it does is it computes a new quantity, which is the, the smooth version of the, 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 the quantity you're interested in, and it computes it uh, iter iteratively. So it starts with a number that is just equal to the first value of electricity you consume. And then it calculates the next one with this uh, simple algorithm. And the reason it's called exponential is that well, if the smooth value now depends on the smooth value before, well, but the smooth value before depends on the one before that, which depends on the one before that, et cetera. So if you just plug that in infinitely, you get sort of a Taylor expansion of an exponential. Uh, so that's the reason why this is called exponential smoothing. And it's also uh, because you can interpret this as saying that if you have this parameter alpha, equal to 10%, that means that you, you pay attention to now, and then you consider 90% of what happened yesterday, and 90% of 90% of what happened the day before, and so on and so on. So you are always considering all the data points, but they have uh, an exponentially decreasing weight to your prediction. So it's very used because it's very simple to understand, and it's also, captures a lot of simple phenomena that may, many times are close enough to business purposes. Uh, a, a more complicated model that also includes this one as a subset is the so-called uh, ARIMA, uh, auto, auto regressive integrated moving average. So why is it called this way? It's auto regressive because it depends on the, the, the errors done in the past. It's a moving average because it's uh, basically the same as this. So you're looking, your value today of your quantity is being computed by looking at a, a weighted average of values in the past. And it's integrated, that's a strange word for a physicist or a mathematician, uh, because whenever you, you always subtract the trend. So you do subtractions, of, not the trend, but imagine I give you this sequence, one, five, 12. Instead of looking at these numbers, you subtract them. So you'll be looking at 4, and then I went to 12, so 4, 7. Uh, and I'm going to analyze that. And you do this operation, you do this subtraction be between consecutive values, 
until you have a, a well-defined uh, distribution of, of values. So it's, uh, uh, this is actually academic in the sense that you cannot apply this to processes that are, have a, a wide variation. So you have to do this subtraction scheme to come up with a, a more regular values. So the way it works, and this is the only big equation I'll show you, is that the model considers the value of any given quantity today to be dependent sort of as, as in an exponential smoothing on the values of the quantity in the previous times, but also being dependent on the error that you have having uh, incurred in by computing a value and the value not being equal to the observed one. So imagine I'm computing the value of uh, electricity consumption today, it will depend on how poorly I computed it yesterday and the day before and etc. Now you can write this equation in a much simplified uh, fashion just as this. This L is the lag operator. So L applied to a point gives the previous point. And then what you have in order for this to be an, an, an ARIMA model is if the characteristic equation of this uh, lag operator has a, a unit root with a, with a, a dimensionality d, you can, uh, meaning if you can basically turn this left-hand side into something like this, and this is reminiscent, reminiscent of uh, algebraic multiplicity when you did linear algebra, then you can write your model in this much more condensed fashion where you basically uh, describe or parameterize your model by three integers, uh, P, D, and Q. Uh, and then of course, what type, what uh, parameters do you use? Well, you vary them, uh, you, you hope for the computer not to burn up and you decide which one is better. So for example, if you look at this and I won't do it due to time, but if you plug zero, one and zero here, or maybe even here, you just get the random walk. So the, the next value is just the previous value plus a random error that of course should be independent, independent from the error in the past. So it's, uh, it's the usual in statistics, it's a zero average and, uh, and unit uh, standard deviation. Uh, so if you plug these values, you get this model again. So I won't go into the mathematics of it anymore. Instead, I'll show you, I'll show you funny pictures. So for this is taken from a paper regarding COVID. And this is something that I, I actually do. Uh, I thought that, well, I'll never read a scientific paper anymore. But uh, no, I do. I read, al although they're mostly about data science, but sometimes they're about applications in other fields with algorithms that I'm trying to translate to, to, to a business sense. So this was one I used uh, because there is not that big of a difference between trying to model a pandemic and trying to model a, a water valve that is slowly eroding. So today it leaks one liter per day, but the hole is, get, is getting bigger. So tomorrow it's going to leak two liters per day. But since it leaked the double, the area of the hole, let's say doubled also. But if the area doubled, then the flow doesn't double. Uh, the, the leak in the next day will be four liters per day and then eight and et cetera. So you can do forecasting of runaway phenomena by looking at what intelligent people do in an academic context. In this case, COVID is the best chance. So uh, thank you, COVID. Basically that tells you that I, I read like one or two papers a week, uh, which is probably a factor of uh, five less than I used to do. Uh, but it's, it's a factor of infinity more than what I expected to do. And I was very pleased to, to know that I would still have to obtain PDFs of papers in uh, my own ways, which I cannot uh, tell you which, what they are. So uh, regarding forecasting and to end and go to another topic, you can do plenty of stuff. You can do sort of basic, but not that much, uh, the composition of a signal into a trans component, uh, a cyclical or harmonic or seasonal comp component, and the noise, uh, sorry, the, the one is the seasonal, and the noise component. Uh, this has to obey the obvious characteristics. So noise has to be noise. This isn't a good noise signal. 
And the reason why I say this is that you see here, you have a pattern. So that tells you, you, you can do a statistical test to, to look for uh, basically lagged regression, uh, la sorry, lagged correlation. See if what happens today depends on what happened one week ago. If it's true noise, it shouldn't depend on anything. Uh, so I, I, I would say this wouldn't pass a, a viable test with any given significance level. But this is important, why? Because sometimes companies are panicking because customers are going away and they need to, to spend a lot of money in, in advertising. And if you do this, you can explain them that they're an ice cream company and it's winter. So then they'll be able to understand maybe we should wait for the summer because there's some cyclical stuff going on. Uh, you can do forecasting where you, you, you take individual clients, for example, and then you look at how clients behave in a given neighborhood. And then you look at the whole city to manage water consumption. This is something I actually did. Uh, and you could do the forecast individually for each client. And you could do the forecast individually for each neighborhood. And at the end, you could do just one big forecast for the city. But you can do this all at once in, in an integrated fashion where you say, give me the, the forecast for the city and for the neighborhoods and for the individuals. But remember that the sum of individuals has to be equal to the, the neighborhood they belong to. And the sum of neighborhoods has to be equal to the city. And this gives a high resilience to, to your method. Uh, and you can do something uh, amazingly cool, which is survival analysis. It comes from uh, biology and, uh, and medical sciences and other, and also engineering in terms of uh, failure rates of, uh, of devices. So you basically, you, you separate your, your data points into different classes and you see how they, uh, how they evolve with time, how many of them fail. For example, here you see if I do regular maintenance after a hundred days, most of them will be working. If I do irregular maintenance, well, plenty of them will be broken. If I do no maintenance, they just break down to 80% of the original after 50 days. Then Cox regression, for example, would be able to tell me what's the, 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 the well, you could call it the regression parameter that relates the, the, inten the intensity of maintenance with the failure uh, rate. And you can do this for 10, 15, well, well, how many columns you are, or variables you want to know. Uh, and you can also do survival trees, which takes us to the next topic, uh, which is classification. So this is to see, uh, or hopefully to wake you up. So we're going to look at this decision tree and to try to understand how it was made. So the question you, plenty of you must be asking, uh, I know I was, uh, is will you have sexy time? So this is bought up for those of you who live in a cave. Uh, and uh, you want to try and come up with an algorithm that allows you to understand if you have a good chance of, of procreating or practicing or not. And you have plenty of factors to decide. So are you a, a man or a woman? Uh, do your parents decide what you wear? And have you ever kissed a non-family member? Those look like three relevant variables. But the question is, how do you decide which split you do first. Why don't you go first for, are you a man or a woman? And then you split on, have you ever kissed a non-family member? And this is very interesting because the way you do this is you basically, you compute all possible uh, decision trees, meaning first I would choose male or female, and then my parents decide what to wear, or if I have ever kissed a non-family member. And for each uh, arrangement of choices, uh, I compute the information gain, which is basically how the Shannon entropy uh, uh, decreases. So you get a more ordered sense of information uh, when you impose a particular choice. And in the end, the decision tree is elaborated, of course, automatically uh, by selecting the choices that uh, increase your information gain. Uh, and uh, Shannon information entropy is, uh, is an amazing concept. It comes from Claude Shannon, many of you probably know. He sort of tried to generalize the, the entropy from thermodynamics, uh, uh, but apply to information theory. And here is a simple example. These two cases, imagine these are the number of clients that go to particular shops. 
And you, if you have clients going to three shops with the same uh, frequency, this scenario has the same uh, uh, entropy than another client that goes to five shops, but in this uh, uh, following this distribution. So this is a very interesting concept and very easy to grasp to a physicist, very complicated tra to transmit to a, to, a, to a business oriented person, because they, the only thing they see here is they want to memorize the number three. They want to say, okay, this information tells me there are three shops the guy goes to. And I try to explain him, no, he has the same variability as this guy who goes to five shops or another guy who could go to only two. Uh, so this is the basis, the theoretical basis in a very small nutshell uh, uh, of classification. And this gives rise to a, a set of problems. Uh, one of them, which is a huge discussion, and it's not exactly as I, I have it here. So one example of this so-called curse of dimensionality is what happens when you have more choices you can make, or basically you have more columns, more variables from which you can choose. Well, what you can see is that if you increase the number of dimensions, uh, the average distance between points increases. So basically, uh, your space, your d-dimensional space becomes less dense. So if it, if it becomes less dense, you cannot find usual uh, uh, significant patterns as easily. So you have to spend more computing time, but that wouldn't be too much of a problem. The big problem is that then you start confusing noise with information because you have less available information, uh, but the noise doesn't have to scale as that. So in the end, what you, you, you might end up with is a, a result that overfits, which basically tells you that it's a result that tries to over explain something. And I'll go to that in the, in the next slide. So how can you try and avoid that? You can do, well, there are plenty of ways and there are plenty of ensemble uh, algorithms or meta algorithms. One of them is to do a random forest. And notice there are also a huge amount of ways of doing this problem. You can do, uh, if it's a categorical, if it's a, a, a continuous value, you can do support vector machines. You can go for a neural network. Uh, you can have just a logistic regression. You have several techniques. This is the one I like the most to, 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 to use to illustrate. So these ensemble methods could apply to many more algorithms than, uh, than decision trees. And basically random forest, for example, a forest is a set of trees. So instead of taking just one huge tree that has a lot of branches corresponding to uh, decisions performed on these three columns, you just select, for example, two columns, A and B, and you train a small tree. And then you select B and C, and you train a different tree because the numbers are different, the tree will be different. And then you select A and C, and you have this tree. So each individual tree is less powerful than if you just use the full amount of data. But that lack of a possibility of digging into uh, patterns is what avoids overfitting because sometimes you're digging too much. And in this case, you don't have the data to, to, to bury yourself as easily. Something else, which is, uh, I think the concept is rather amazing is boosting, which basically tells you this. Imagine you have these data points where uh, you have some uh, positives and negatives and you classify them like this. Well, you've made some mistakes. This is a negative. You you said it was a positive. So you repeat the algorithm, but you, but you pay more attention to the ones you got wrong. So these two and this plus, you can see it in, increased in size. Well, now it comes up with this classification. You got these three points wrong. You repeat the algorithm. And in the end, you, com you combine all of them and you have a much better uh, uh, classifier all built out of a binary classifier that just tells you up or down or left or right is the separation surface. So uh, I'll, this is not, well, this is very interesting and relevant, but not as uh, interesting to talk here, maybe. You have to be careful about, as I was saying, trying to come up with patterns where they don't exist. So you have to balance uh, variance with bias. So you have to have a good model that doesn't have erroneous assumptions but not too good because if it's too good, it will start fitting 
what is basically noise. So you can see here, the best model is this one. This would be any given function that behaves as this, like an, an exponential, for example, one minus the, with a negative, uh, a negative time constant. So this is the best model. This is not a good one, has high bias. It has erroneous assumptions. It assumes it's a straight line, but this is also bad. It has very low bias, so it's very good to get to those points. But what if I include a slightly different point? Then it would have a huge error because it was overfitted to the data I had. This is sort of similar to the Gibbs phenomena you can get in, in Fourier analysis for, a, um, I think that's second year undergrad or something like that. So this tells you that the best model is not the one that takes the most data and spends the most time computing. It's also the one that uses the brain of the programmer to come up with this equilibrium. So this is the so-called Goldilocks uh, uh, model. It's not uh, too big not, nor too small, it's just right. So moving forward, how do, you, how do you evaluate these models? Well, you have to have a metric uh, and the metric many people use is precision or recall. And this is now a current uh, affairs topic because of the, the COVID tests. So this is similar to true positive rate and or false, negative, false positive rate, et cetera. But the point is that you don't want to go for models with high pre precision or high recall all the time. One size does not fit all as this gentleman demonstrates. For example, if you have a disease test, you want to maximize recall. If you look at this expression, that means you want to minimize false negatives. You don't, don't want to say to somebody, you don't have COVID if they do. Even if the price is saying somebody, you have COVID if they don't. And don't give me the crap, the Facebook crap, because if you do the numbers right and you consider the amount of sequential tests that go around, uh, they're, they're not zombie COVID people uh, going around with, with no COVID. The, the testing procedure is reliable. Now, if you go for movie recommendation, you want to maximize precision. I'll tell you 10 movies you, you have to see. It doesn't matter if I missed some movies you would really like. So I told you, this movie sucks, but if you actually saw it, you would love it. But I'm just giving you 10 movies to see. So what you want to avoid is false positives. You don't want to go through a movie that I told you was great and you hate it. You just want to make sure all the movies I give you are nice. Uh, even at the cost of not coming up with some movies that you might also have liked. So this is a way of illustrating the need to think about what metric you want. Uh, and you can go for hybrid metrics, for example, uh, you can mix precision and recall, but the best way to go about it is to try and plot the curve that tells you how precision and recall evolves as you become more lenient. So for example, your model predicts that you are a positive uh, COVID uh, uh, case with a given threshold. If your results are above a, re a given con concentration of virus above a, a, a given value, then you're a positive, opposite you're a negative. Your precision and recall will depend on this uh, value, this threshold you choose for your test. So precision and recall, you can always change them by going up and down this curve, for example. But what you cannot change is the actual area under the curve. So the best way in my mind to, 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 to come up with the quality of a model is to look at the area under the curve and you can discuss it later if you want. This has to be way larger than the actual prevalence of positive cases in the population. Because the prevalence of, pop of, uh, of the positive cases in the population gives you the, the basically the expectation of what the random classifier will do. So this is just one slide to put Monty Python in, which is always good. This is cross-validation. Basically the way you actually turn this into a program is you take the data, you take a little bit of data to test in the end, you never touch it. And then you come up, for example, with 10 models where you train with the blue part and you test your predictions with the red part. And you vary the, the, the subset of data where you're testing your predictions to try and come up with 10 different models that will be unbiased, that have the ability to explain unknown data. So, almost finished if you're counting whoops 
neural networks, uh, something everybody loves. Uh, and it's actually, it's amazing in practical sense. And it's very interesting because it's very simple. It's basically a linear combination. So you take inputs and then you combine them with given weights, uh, theta. You, and you take a given combination and you take that combination as the argument of a, a transfer function and this is relatable to uh, electrical engineering people who are very used to this vocabulary, perhaps. Uh, and the output is the, the, the value of the function. And this gives you a prediction. So for example, this could be your age, sex, uh, well, not sex because it's not continuous, age, uh, weight, uh, number of streets, uh, et cetera. And you want to predict the probability of having sexy time. And then you could compare the number that comes out of it with, you run the experiment, you go out at night a hundred times and you count the, the, the amount of times you, you had, sexy time. Uh, and this is basically it as to a neural network. Of course, you can decide what type of, uh, of transfer function you choose of activation function coming from biology, what happens in your brain. And you also can select, and this is crucial, how you optimize this because learning in this case is coming up with the best set of uh, weights that best fit the data you have available a simple neural network has only one hidden layer the the the, the fancy term deep learning basically means you have plenty of hidden layers where you don't know what's going on so that's it for neural networks in a nutshell but it's of course a huge topic and it relies mostly in uh, computing power. So final slide, I said I was ending in natural stupidity. So this is IR Baboon, 90s cartoon, amazing. Uh, and it represents some of the, the, the difficulties I have dealt with. And this is good because this is what happens, this is what, this is what stops computers from dominating the world, is that you have stupid people operating them. So you have plenty of, uh, of cases. Uh, in computers we trust is when you consider a computer to be the same as a ref uh, refrigerator. Nobody thinks about the, the, the condenser in the back circulating the, the, the fluid and keeping it a thermodynamic cycle. It's just a box that makes cold. A computer is just a box that makes numbers. It's not. You have to understand a computer to optimize its memory, to run com uh, programs in parallel. Plenty of, of, of stuff to do. People forgetting about data types. Everything is a number. We're all reduced to numbers now. No, unfortunately, because it would be much easier, but we're also reduced to ordinal uh, characteristics like uh, I am uh, uh, tall or average or, or, or small. That could be related to a continuous number or maybe not. Maybe it's just uh, yes, no, uh, and you have a, a, an order here. Yes is better than no. Uh, that is not good for a computer. You have to translate that into a number. You also have the no mathematics, please. We're working here, which is you try to explain why this method is the best, but people don't have the time and don't care because they think that that's not business oriented. Boxes remains to, uh, uh, refers to not going through the paces of actually knowing the algorithms and programming them in Python or R or whatever but just using a random collection of tools where you drag, I want to use a, a, a logistic regression and you drag a box and you have no idea what the box is doing. It's a black box. In the end, you'll get some numbers. You have no idea what they mean and if they could be improved or not. Uh, uh, it worked last time. It's just do an algorithm and then rely on it five years later because it worked for that client uh, and now it should work in a different country, different area, different uh, uh, commercial enterprise, etc. Uh, and finally, the the not everybody is a data scientist. You have data engineers, people who approach data and make sure it works. It can be fed to a computer, and you have data vis visualizers, people who uh, work in presenting the information in the most beautiful and accessible way. But that doesn't mean that everybody can say, yes, I know artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever. Uh, this is not trying to separate us from them or whatever, but you have to be careful when talking to people because sometimes they just assume they know more than they actually do, as in my case. So to end, thank you. I ran slightly over time.
uh, and questions. No questions. Well, can I have? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Can I? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, first let me thank uh, George for this very nice talk, very instructive. Um, as you may guess, I know nothing about uh, data, data, uh, big data and small data, let's put it this way. Um, uh, but anyway, thank you very much. It's very nice to see you again. Um, so my question is, is the following. Uh, you have uh, told us that uh, you can use a channel uh, information uh, in order to have an idea about how the order of uh, of asking questions interfere in the in the in the outcome of something right that's mm -hmm. if i do if i did understand yeah. it properly so my question is the following uh, let's let's take george it's obvious uh, that you are uh, for me it's more than obvious and uh, I knew that beforehand that you, you would get involved in data analysis, you would be very good on it. But um, uh, I would like to, to ask you the following. Let's change the order. Let's try to, <laughs> let's try to assume that in start of, uh, instead of uh, have you started in physics, you have started in data analysis and then you have grown through physics and uh, and then somehow you go back to data analysis. Uh, what would be the outcome? So uh... that's a difficult forecast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that you would be probably more result oriented uh, uh, and less detailed in the in how you get to it. So you would be very sure of your your result, but you wouldn't be able to 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 tell people or yourself how deviations from that path would impact results. So most of the times I say, I chose this because I did this analysis that sort of sensitivity analysis. And if you go this way, it will be worse. If you go this way, it will be better, but will cost a double. So I chose this. And what I see most people doing is uh, I, I chose this and here is the result. It's the best you can get with this choice. And I would say they would be very good in developing and understanding the algorithm, which is a big difference between stepping through physics or not, is understanding the mathematics of it. So that would be my take. Thank you. Well, thank you. So more questions or do you want to, oh, somebody? Yeah. I think somebody was trying to say something or not. Or if you want to see some, some other slide about uh, something that I didn't discuss because I, uh, I swept over it. Yes, please ask questions. Yeah. Well, or questions can about- Can I ask another question then? Well, if people- okay. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, the, the, you see, when young people do not ask questions, there is always a dinosaur uh, to, <laughs> to replace them. So my other question would be, um, do you envisage uh, situations on which uh, you can, uh, let's say, use uh, this, this technology to fit data in physics? which is much more specific. While you are treating big loads of data, which have lots of uh, uh, properties, but in physics, you usually, uh, you usually have data, which is, I assume more homogeneous, I mean. Uh, well, there, there are some situations, but they are, well, in astronomy. So that depends on whether you consider uh, astronomy to be a, uh, a, an area in physics or a separate science. No, uh, I consider it a separate science. Physics, yeah, it's the particular yeah. case of physics. Yeah. So in physics, physics, uh, I would say that you 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 have some some attempts to basically do a, a, a meta analysis of theories. So you have competing theories, uh, and you have competing predictions. And you try to come up with a sort of as in the, for example, the PPN formula is in, in, uh, in general relativity, where you give different weights to how how gravity, how, how much a uh, mass affects the curvature of space time, 
or how nonlinear is gravity and etc you can take that as inputs and you can come up with a, an algorithm that tries to decide what is the the, the best observable universe that fits the, the actual real observation that's that's but that falls into the I don't like it particularly. For example, Wolfram's uh, theory where you can have a computable universe also takes that into account. And that falls into a category of, uh, I'm not going to think about the theory. I'm just going to write all the theories I can and then let the machine decide for me. But that's a very high level uh, uh, use of this. More low level, I would say, uh, for example, sometimes we do statistics, we have, we have a prediction and then we have a result and then we use chi-square or whatever to say this, is, this was a good fit or this wasn't a good fit. Uh, but most of the times we fix the priors even unconsciously. Uh, and this can be used, for example, uh, classification systems can help you understand you have a good fit if you assume that the model is correct. But if you assume the model was wrong and the a hurricane affected your experiment, you could also have a good fit. And it helps you understand how different choices that you make unconsciously uh, can, can uh, affect the, the, the conclusions, not the actual outcome numerically, but the conclusions. Sometimes we conclude something and we never consider that some other alternative could also be well supported by data. Mm -hmm. That's not a very good answer because I, I think there is a very, uh, a, a, a huge distance yet to to overcome regarding this question. Okay, thank you. I, I have a, a question. An example? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that uh, in uh, string phenomenology, in the last couple of years, people are starting to probe huge numbers of uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds to see which ones are compatible with certain type of particle species at low energies. So it's, it's also being used there, for example. Yeah, that's an example of uh, the, the mixing theories, the, the bag of theories. It's, it's a, a term in data science is bag of something, bag of words. Uh, so uh, there, there are some cool papers about bag of theories where you just consider a lot of them and try to come up with the, the most meaningful one. Thank yeah, you. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Some more I, questions? I, I, yeah, it's not a question, but George, George, can you comment a little bit about the the interpreting, uh, like clustering, uh, in for example, I, I'm I'm thinking about like uh, computer co computer vis vision stuff, like um, uh, MRIs and CT scans to find the uh, cancer cells mm -hmm. and something like that. Uh, I think uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't read a lot about it, but uh, if you know something, can you can you share with us about that interpretation of clustering and? Uh, you mean interpretation of, in terms of the the machine telling you, I found a cancer versus I didn't find one, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and okay. how and how they did that because. Uh, uh, Doctors and have to hey they 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 have to to be sure that yeah that that is a, a possible problem or not. Um, yeah, well, uh, they uh, actually I think just from the, the 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 final part, the ethical part, they have to be sure. So I think most of the times they 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 run tests right after they have indications of coming from. And I actually think they're very conservative as to interpreting uh, freely the results from any uh, uh, computer vision or associated scheme. Now, uh, I know that uh, I know this because a colleague of mine did it. Uh, basically, treat uh, it's it's not called computer vision anymore uh, in most areas, but because if you do clustering, for example, you're looking for nodes uh, in your body in a given organ, or you're looking for regions of different contrast. And that could signal more dense object or a more dense tissue that could be cancerous in origin. Uh, uh, then you would you would use clustering, and then the the big problem is that you have to be aware of the model you're putting in. So imagine this case, but instead of having the colors, you just have slightly different shades of gray, which looks like a, a soft core version of fifty shades of gray, slightly different uh, shades. So imagine you would ask it to give you 50 clusters 
and it would, it would produce this image, but in grayscale. And you would have a darker cluster and a lighter cluster. Would that be sufficient to say that the darker cluster means you have a more dense area where fluids don't flow as freely and then you have a, a, a cancer of some sort? No, because you asked for 50 clusters. If you asked for 500 clusters, they would sh shrink in, in size so you would have a much more pinpoint region. So that was a problem with the, the actual assumptions of the model in clustering. Uh, nowadays, I know what is done is uh, contemporary computer vision, where instead you train a model with images where you know that. Uh, so going back, this would make it an unsuper unsupervised problem. You're just looking for nodules of some sort. Yeah, yeah. And, but nowadays it's mostly a supervised problem. So you take MRI scans of people you know have cancer and people you know don't have cancer. And you come up with a model that looks at basically the image, the pixels and transforms them, does Fourier transforms, contrast filters, uh, adaptive filters, uh, and does this either old school, meaning one step at a time, or just all built to, into a huge deep learning uh, neural network and outputs yes or no. Yes, this point has a cancer. This is also model dependent, depends on the architecture of the, the neural network you're considering, but it learns from existing data and it gives much better results. So I would say in the end, the, the answer is that you have to run this in academic circles. You have to publish a lot of papers showing that your model is very good in predicting cancers or whatever when compared with, uh, with, uh, with data, you know the, the outcome. And then it gets into production, meaning it gets into real life situations where you have uh, computers advising, uh, advising you to take an aspirin because you have a fever and you, have, uh, and you sweat and et cetera. And this is, all, this is all the same, this is all science. So basically that's science and I wouldn't call it data science in the typical business sense of going to a company and doing something. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I know it doesn't answer it fully. I don't know if it's sufficient. I just wanted to know your like your experience about that. So so yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I, more questions? Yeah. I have a question if we still have time. It's just a much more generic one. I, I used to have a, a lecture that it often said that physicists are the Swiss army knife of sciences. Um, and most participants in Planck's, there be third, fourth year undergrad, master students, often going on the debate of whether they want to do a PhD, go straight into industry, maybe do a postdoc. Um, so I was just uh, wondering, um, be probably useful that I often see that question around on Discord. Uh, if you wanted just to share some of your advice of, with people that might be trying to make that decision now. I would say if, you, if you're thinking too much about that decision, uh, uh, I would say that probably you don't look uh, at having a, a career in science as, as much as, as a vocation, but more as a profession, which is fine. But then you'd have to come up with a, what pays you the best and uh, how what's the workload and et cetera. Uh, and so I would be inclined to say, if you think too much about it, go to industry. The opposite, those that actually don't think about it, just fear the, the, their decision. They, they know they want to go to science, but they fear that they're going to spend 10 years, 15 years, uh, and then suddenly they have to, to change to another area. Of course, that was a fear I had. And that I can assure you that you have nothing to fear, but fear itself. Meaning that you can come out of science and you can still be a scientist, which is different because people will value your, your, your unique skill set, and, uh, and it will be, and it, you'll be much more uh, differentiated from the rest of the workforce. Uh, and that, that is valuable in terms of money, in terms of opportunities, in terms of a career. So don't worry too much about the decision. Uh, if you really want to go to science, please do. And if you really have to leave science, don't worry, just get another job and then earn the same amount or hugely more, a hugely bigger amount of money. Yeah, good advice, thanks.
You're welcome. Is there any other question? We are uh, 20 minutes in uh, the coffee break. So I think no one complained, no one left. So I think, I think mm -hmm. everyone enjoys, so that's fine. That's fine. So no more questions. Thank, Thank you, George, for, for, for giving this, this amazing workshop. People are saying that it was good. So that's awesome. Thank you. And if, um, you want to, if anybody wants to contact me for any reason, just to have some chat about leaving science, or entering science, feel free. My email is, is well, it's in plenty of places. <laughs>